Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with some more of the Great War. This time we're on to week 58. The Western Front awakens. The Tsar takes over. Um, so, good. We're going to finally see some more uh, action happening on the Western Front. That should be exciting and depressing. This whole war is depressing. What am I saying? And the Tsar takes over. So we know that's going to go totally great. Before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. All right. All that stuff's out of the way. Let's go ahead and just dive right fucking in. Russia has been in deep trouble for months, retreating uh -oh. and losing territory week by week. And this week, the Tsar himself tries to do something about it. This week sees a full shakeup in the Russian high command. <gasps> Gas. I don't know why, but my lighting feels much better. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to ass. the Great War. The Allies had tried and failed again last week at Gallipoli, with huge casualties, and the situation there was grim. The Russians had lost even more land to the Germans, but took a load of Austrian prisoners in the south. The war in the skies heated up in the west with bombing runs all week. The Armenian genocide grew mm. ever worse, and the Indian army secured its borders. To start off today, I'm not going to talk about a country or a front, but about a man, and it's a man I haven't yet mentioned. On August 31st, one of the most daring and brilliant pilots of all time, the Frenchman Adolphe Pegoud, met his fate. Pegoud was a test pilot for Louis Blériot before the war, during which- Gotta love these French names. Hmm. Which time, he flew the first upside down flight ever, was the first pilot to make a parachute jump, became the second pilot to loop the loop, and was <laughs> the first flying ace. First to shoot down five or more planes. He died this week nice. when he was shot down by one of his pre-war students. German Unteroffizier Walter Kandulski. He was that is crazy. Holy shit. He was 26 years old. Kandulski and his crew later dropped a wreath for Pegoud over the French lines. We haven't talked very mm -hmm. much about the Western Front over the summer, mostly because there weren't... Somewhat wholesome? Still killed him. That is war. ...any large offensives. And indeed, this week, there weren't any either. Just a week-long artillery duel. Yep, just. Though this was a relentless pounding of colossal proportions that never, ever stopped. But there was a lot going on behind the scenes in the planning stages at this point, which I want to take a look at. Now, the French High Command was determined to launch a major offensive this month, ideally to break through the German lines, but also to try to... Well, like, you're in war. It's been happening for over a year now. I feel like, you know, when you're fighting a war... The thing you should do is to, uh, break the enemy lines. I'm glad the French High Command has very, the very basic understanding of how to conduct war. Doing great. ...to take some of the pressure off of the Russians, who had been retreating for four months now. But there was a lot of disagreement in the French High Command about exactly what they were going to do. General Joseph Joffre was in favor not of a breakthrough on a narrow front that could be fairly easily plugged, but a wide-ranging series of multiple offensives that would support each other and cause confusion in the German high command, foil the accurate deployment of reserves, and eventually break the lines entirely at a decisive point. Ferdinand Foch had ideas along the lines of the British bite-and-hold tactics, which would be much more methodical but restrained and would involve a series of meticulously planned steps that would depend on the range of the artillery. General Philippe Pétain, who was now in charge of the 2nd French Army and a rising star, saw the war in simple terms of attrition. He believed the winner would be the last man standing, and his strategy was mostly defensive and was designed... I mean, he ain't wrong. ...to conserve manpower mm. with the occasional limited attack to avoid large-scale losses. Thing is, None of these were really wrong, but they didn't really yeah. present any coherent solution considering what the Western Front was like by September 1915. The German lines, day by day, grew stronger with more trenches and more barbed wire. They now even had concrete fortifications as well as deeper dugouts and self-contained defense stations. They also had an entire second trench system back a couple miles behind the lines that was not within Allied field artillery range. It also didn't help that the Germans were, at this point, masters of the sky. Thanks to the interrupter gear they had developed over the summer that allowed their pilots to fire their machine guns through their propellers. Okay. I still don't understand the science behind how it works. 
German numbers on the Western Front had been a bit down, since many soldiers had been sent east to fight the Russians. But what would the French do against the increasingly well-entrenched Germans? Well, Joffrey's solution for that was to take a page from Mackensen's book. August von Mackensen being the German general whose artillery had precipitated the Russian retreat in the first place. Joffrey planned, to put it simply, to blast the German positions from the face of the earth. And to do this, he demanded more and more heavy artillery, so that it would be roughly the same numbers as his field artillery. And by this time, the French had 4,646 field guns Damn. and 3,538 heavy guns. This was Joffrey's battering ram. And they began to plan for the day when the hammer would finally come down. And speaking of the Russian retreat, the Germans had been forcing the Russians back in Poland and the Baltic and driven them from Warsaw and Kovno. And this week, they were advancing towards the Nieman River and the last Russian stronghold on it, the fortress of Grodno. On August 30th, German forces stormed the city of Lipsk, less than 30 kilometers west of Grodno. And south of the Nieman, they advanced on the Grodno-Vilnius Railway. On the 31st came the first reports that the devastating German heavy artillery had been brought up and was shelling the fortress from the west. There was not much hope left for the Russians there, for at every point those guns had been brought to bear, they had blasted their way to the goal, no matter how strong or modern the defenses. Indeed, Grodno fell to Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg's army on September 2nd, after they forced a crossing of the Nieman River. The four historic Russian frontier fortresses, Kovno, Novogeorgievsk, Brest-Litovsk and Grodno had now all fallen, and the Germans set their sights on Vilnius, the most important of the western cities of the Russian Empire since Warsaw had fallen. But the Russians had, by abandoning the entire Polish salient, shortened their front from 1,000 to 600 miles, which of course gave them a much better economy of force. Nice. So they could now send reserves to the Baltic and the center, and to even counterattack, as they did at Lutsk on the 1st taking 7,000 German prisoners, and also in South Galicia, where on August 30th, they took 4,000 prisoners and 30 big guns. But the demoralization of the Russian army after the months of retreat and loss was undeniable, and there had been rumors about changes in the Russian leadership for weeks. This week, those rumors became fact. The Grand Duke Nikolai was dismissed as commander of the Russian armies this week and would be replaced by Tsar Nicholas himself. He Yay. would be more the new head in name, though, and the man who would really direct the armies was the new chief of staff of Stavka, General Mikhail. What is... Hold on, there's... That's a... Is this a photo taking, taken by, like, the Soviets? This doesn't seem right. I don't know, there's something off about this photo, I feel like. Like, he looks dead. Just with the way his eyes... Uh, like, his... The, Pupils are like, look, I don't know, the way he's looking just looks distant, like he's dead. Alexeyev, but the Tsar's future as the now personal leader was now really tightly bound to the successes and failures of his armies. Those armies were now divided up on three fronts. The North, now once again under General Nikolai Ruski, the West under General Alexei Evert, and the Southwest under Nikolai Ivanov. The Grand Duke Nikolai, after his removal from office, was appointed Viceroy of the Caucasus on the 3rd. Minister of War Alexei Polivanov, who was very much against the Tsar taking personal control, announced this week that Russia would raise another 2 million men. And Damn. in a related note, German General Hans Hartwig von Bessler was appointed the Governor General of the former Russian territories of Poland, now in German hands. And this week, we also saw once again that it was indeed a world war. In Northwest India, the Indian army again defeated the Bunarwal tribesmen, this time at the Malandri Pass on August 28th. After two more skirmishes during the week, they were finally scattered on September 2nd. And in German East Africa, British mounted infantry beat the enemy near Maktan. Further north on the Italian front, the Italians took Monte Sista on the 28th but unsuccessfully assaulted the bridgehead of Tolmino September 2nd. Yay. And that brings us to the end of the week of a war fought on three continents by soldiers from five. The Russians radically changed their high command, even as they finally have some success counterattacking, but lose their last great European fortress to the Germans.
Plans are being hatched on the Western Front as the artillery pounds away and the first flying ace dies. It's true what I said earlier, that setbacks to the Russian armies would now reflect upon the Tsar himself, which is why the cabinet nearly unanimously opposed it. It would be a few days before it was all official, but still, the Tsar was not a military strategist. Having said that, the man he replaced, his cousin, Grand Duke Nikolai... Holy fuck, either, either the Tsar is short, or the Grand Duke is fucking tall. He's a whole head... No. Goes to about his shoulders. Yeah, over a head taller than... Nikolaevich had never commanded in the field before the war broke out, and he was suddenly given command of the largest army ever put in the field in history up to that point. Okay, he didn't do all that badly, all things considered. Okay, judging by how he is using a cane, I'm guessing he is freakishly tall. But you would think the Russians would want a real field leader in command. You'd be wrong though, since <laughs> Russia continually moved incompetent officers up through its ranks in a system riddled with nepotism, patronage, and political intrigue, and it reflected in the field. We've seen so many Russian failures that could have been prevented, that have resulted in hundreds of thousands of needless deaths, but all too often, the feeling of the Russian leadership was, so what? It's only men. The Russians had been retreating since the beginning of May when the German Gorlitsa Tarnov offensive kicked off. If you'd like to see our episode about how that all got started, you can check it out. Oh, all right. Oh, God, the Gorlitsa Tarnov offensive. That's a while ago. Anyways, that was the Western Front Awakens. The Tsar takes over the Great War Week 58. This was a decent episode. Uh, I think better than some previous ones. Um, nothing outstanding, though, I feel like. Uh... Not not really anything happened actually on the Western Front except for they're starting to plan to do something. Woohoo, probably will take them another five months to actually get off their asses and do something. But yeah, the Tsar, the Tsar has taken over. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.